We got three days left until the FOMC, the greatest money-making opportunity. Uh, it has come in several months, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning. Hope you're having a wonderful start or evening, depending on when you're watching this. Today, we're going to be talking about Jerome Powell, how he never promised you Fed rate cuts. He only said, where well, it's time to shift policy. And that can take multiple forms. We're going to be discussing how that can impact the stock market, what happened this week, and just giving you a simple trade, options trade out there that you can do to actually profit regardless whichever way the market goes, unless the market does absolutely nothing, which let's face it, the probability on FOMC week that the market does absolutely nothing is like 0.01. So again, unlike probabilities, we got a 50-50 split in the FOMC expectations. We got 50% expect 50 basis point and 25 basis point. None expect no rate cuts. I personally think that we're going to get 25. I think that a lot of people talking about that we're going to get no rate cuts. They are in the camp of just hoping that their portfolio doesn't actually go down because they're not short the market. And the net speculative positions are net short the market. So again, if you look at this chart, please tell me where the bearishness lies, right? Where the bearishness in this whole thing lies because I can't see it, right? And also, as I mentioned before, I am net bullish on the market, unlike the net speculative positions, negative 56,000 contracts, which in my opinion is a mistake. They're repeating the same mistake that they have constantly been repeating. Unlike us, we learn from our mistakes. And I've been doing this for over three years now, trading the market in these crazy times. I took a break since 2016. 16 after COVID where I kind of took a beating. However, I learned from that lesson and been profitable ever since. As we can see with the net positions that I have, I have a mix of bullish positions in here along with a couple short positions that haven't doing so well. However, overall balance to the upside preparing for this week to be very, very good. I'm expecting NVIDIA and Apple to kind of stop being the laggers and start pushing up higher. I got in them not at the best times. However, S&P, NASDAQ, and Russell all added to the portfolio this week for a net bullish delta, right? Net bullish delta affected is 26, right? So I'm basically betting for every dollar the market goes up, I'm going to make $26 on the portfolio and having only $5 a theta kind of selling some uh, put positions in there in order to cover that delta, kind of balancing that out as I teach you guys on this channel. If you guys want to follow for more, we'll have some options videos linked down in the description below explaining options for you, kind of like an introductory thing. But enough about that. You guys are here to know what happened to the markets, right? We're basically expecting a nice continuation of this for the S&P. What happened this week? Well, one of the craziest days was Wednesday, right? When we got the CPI report, I was expecting that we were going to get a massive rally. We did, but we cratered. I mean, this thing was selling like no tomorrow. And I'm like staring at it being like, guys, you got the numbers you wanted. Why on earth? Then bulls stepped up like they always do, nearly forming a double bottom on the week, not forming a weekly low or low and just pounding this thing, right? You guys just pounded, pounded, pounded and went to pound town and basically went higher. You broke through every single level. Once we got above the 555 rotation that I basically called out on the last week in deep dive, I put my money where my mouth is and basically initiated all these bullish positions. I was looking, okay, what's not really running to basically take advantage of the lagger effect. And again, we're going to talk about what levels we need this week, but I want to recap quickly what the Nasdaq did as well, right? So Nasdaq, again, similar story, mirror image to S&P, but it's even more important. We got back above the 50-day moving average, which signifies further continuation of this bullish approach, right? We continued higher. We broke above uh, 473.33, which is the weekly higher high. And now we're going to start challenging these upper price points. Again, the Nasdaq actually is not at all-time highs. It is approximately about 5.82%, very easy to cover on NFOMC. We've seen the NASDAQ and S&P do crazy two, 3% days. Just as a point, we did a 4% rotation just on this last Wednesday when we were down 2% and rotated positive 2%. That was insane. Like you're talking about a three standard deviation move, which is seldom rarely seen in markets. However, it signifies a big shift in the mentality of the market. But enough of talking about the market. What levels, Mike, do we need to pay attention to in order to basically get money out of this FOMC meeting? And also what bullish position or bearish position do you need to play in order to get further in the market? So looking at the S&P right here, we can clearly see we're very close to all time highs and a bullish rotation above 56303. That's the level we're going to have to be watching out for. And it's going to be very, very bullish if we're running into the FOMC, right? 
everyone's expecting, as I said in the beginning of the video, some form of rate cuts. And if they don't necessarily get their expectation, they could easily FOMO into the market because Jerome Powell most likely wants you to be bullish this market. He wants to be right more, more than actually landing the ship, right? He wants to be right. Now that's long-term got some implications that we need to talk about later in the discussion part of the video. But again, any rotation by 6303, I'm gonna be adding into the positions. I'm gonna be looking at how I can make these bullish positions right here even more bullish. How, what can I add? I'm most likely gonna add more S&P, gonna add more NASDAQ. I'm gonna be looking at if I can roll that S&P further up if it goes fully in the money, right? Gonna be looking at all these things, how I can take profit out of the table, put more exposure out on the market, and then continue that rotation as long as the levels hold, right? Now, if I go below 565.16 once we break to new all-time highs, of course, I'm going to start trimming these positions. Guys, just your basic math. If you're below this level, you trim or you stop adding positions. If you're above it, you keep adding positions. Why are you guys going to say, as we're breaking above to new blue sky breakout, that we're going to go down lower? Wait for the chart to prove that to you and then play the chart. That's simple, right? I've been talking about a market crash for almost two years on this market. Uh, this market and simply hasn't happened yet. I'm preparing for it in the back of my mind. I'm basically saying, okay, how, where can I basically, what is the worst case scenario in these positions? It's why I have bracket orders whenever I put S&P NASDAQ trades, where I'm basically saying max profit, max loss. I'm minimizing my risk because again, as bankers, right, this banker mentality of just continuously nothing can go wrong. And then we line up with a blow up that basically catastrophically affects your portfolio. Keep thinking in the sense of the black swan, right? How can it screw your portfolio up and how you can protect against it? Just make every trade centralized about that and I guarantee you, you will make money on this market. Now, let's jump over to the NASDAQ real quick. So looking at the NASDAQ, very, very similar story to the S&P. One thing to note about the NASDAQ, which is gonna be crucial, you guys have to pay attention to the NASDAQ regardless if you're trading it or not, because if the NASDAQ dips down, then the S&P dips down with it. Again, chips lead tech, tech lead spy. It's, we talked about this incessantly on the channel. The 50-day moving average is gonna be a crucial point for us. We do not want to retrace back below. It's two candle closes now above it. We really wanna see the nine-day moving average pushing up to support this level, because then we know, okay, two closes above that, rocket up higher. That's why I initiated the NASDAQ position once we got back above the 50, because I wanted to see how it reacted and where we would open. We opened strong, pushed up higher, initiated another position on it. So again, 476, 54 is gonna be that same mentality point. Now, the difference between the NASDAQ is we have 485.54 as another target. It is not necessarily resistance because of the how this week is shaping up. We may get some chop around there, but I would expect if you're looking for a bullish week, that we rotate above 476.53 on Monday, we push up to 485.54 going into the PAL and then break it on PAL. That would be the most catastrophic position for the bears. It would be the most bullish position for the bulls. And that's how the continuation can occur. We've seen NASDAQ do crazy, crazy things. Now, let's say we're struggling to get above 476.53 going into PAL. That is where you need to stop and actually just sit on your hands for a little bit. Because if you sit on your hands, you let that foam C play out, you're not gonna necessarily miss out on the whole move. You're gonna miss out on, let's say, 25% of the move, but you're gonna have 75% of the move, we would certainty, where you're gonna be calm collected. I open my account at nine o'clock, look at what's kind of cheap to buy around bullish bearish positions above the nine, above the 50, right? I close my account and then I open it up at 12 o'clock and four o'clock for about 15 minutes. That's all I spent. You don't have to sit here basically spending excessive amount of time watching the markets on and on and on and on, right? You can use fancy indica indicators like this, right? I use Lexalgo, link in the description below if you guys wanna check it out, but you don't need this, right? This is just to give me entry and exit points and basically reaffirm what I'm seeing here. Again, you don't need that. You just simply need to look. Weekly breakout, weekly breakdown. It is simple as that, right? As simple as I can make it, and it's been one of the most successful strategies once I've simplified everything, right? We can talk insensibly about the yield curve falling off a cliff, wrecking everyone's portfolio. And yes, for all those that watch the channel, it's still uninverted, I told you so. So again, enough about that before I chase that rabbit down for the next three years. Let's talk about Bitcoin, right? Bitcoin and some of the more riskier assets. This is con continuing the information that we're gonna get a bullish rally. Bitcoin above the 200, nice strong push. Now the question is, 66, is it gonna happen, right? Are we gonna form a weekly higher high, right? Is it gonna break above 65? Is it gonna go to 66 and meet resistance? 
You want to see Bitcoin running like no tomorrow if you're going to get a bullish rally into the market. And half September, traditionally, the first half is very bloody. And then the second half is the recovery. So we're heading into the second half. We're halfway to the month today. So again, the question is, is it going to basically shift the mentality in the markets? We also have more risky assets like NVIDIA, right? NVIDIA holding that 50. That's why I initiated. I did not get the most best entry on it, but I'm not looking for the best entry on NVIDIA. I'm looking to play this W that's basically forming on the charts here. If you can't see it, here's the W for you. This is massive potential for NVIDIA to run to new all-time highs. That is my opinion if the Fed sets it up for success. If it doesn't, then I have a very, very short stop loss and lose very little money. Apple, similar story, but I'm a little more concerned with Apple, right? Being transparent to you guys, Apple position was initiated when we were about 222 right now. I'm down on the position due to a contraction in IV and Theta. But again, I'm looking to see if this 50 chop, really, how it plays out. Heading into a bullish week, I'm expecting the market to drag Apple with it because Apple is such a big proportion of the market. So again, Apple cannot be bearish while the market is bullish. It's just two things that can't happen. The same way with Microsoft, right? And if we look at Microsoft, we can clearly see I'm pushing up the 50. I missed this opportunity. It's probably going to be on the shopping list this week for Microsoft because it has a huge potential to run up. So it may be on the shopping list on Monday. Make sure you guys follow on the Discord in order to basically know when we're going, what trades are happening. I post my future trades on there. I'm going to start putting and creating an options channel for the, these trades so you can follow along. And also, if you guys wouldn't mind, hit the subscribe button so you know when these videos come out. We've been trying to grow the channel. And as always, if you guys wouldn't mind hitting the like button, it really helps the channel out, lets YouTube know you enjoyed this content. And also, more importantly than all of that, can you throw a comment down below to say what you want us to follow, what you want us to talk about? Do you want more options of fundamentals? Do you want more technical analysis on the channel? We want to favorite for you, the viewer on this channel. So again, thank you so much for watching. But again, we covered Bitcoin, but we haven't covered the other volatile index, which is VIX itself, the volatility index, right? Pun not intended there. But VIX is coming back down. It's below the 50. I may finally get my $12 VIX trade. I will let you know when I get my $12 VIX trade because I've been begging for this thing for the longest time, right? I missed the opportunity for that last VIX run as I said it was going to happen. Shame on me for not rolling those contracts. But then again, I'm going to be looking at that. Probably going to be looking to sell options going into the FOMC because as VIX heads down, the selling options is very beneficial, especially when we get the Delta move and I balance out some of that theta in the portfolio. I've been trying to experiment with minimizing theta while having directional plays in the portfolio. That's what I really want to emphasize on what I'm looking for that portfolio. And I'll keep you guys updated, probably do a series video of optimizing theta in that. So make sure you guys are subscribed for that, right? And talking about chips, right? Talking about my best friend's favorite company, AVGO, cranked down the lows, bounced on the 200. Very good, right? 23% rally on this one, right? 25%, right? So awesome company. Probably an excellent time to sell some covered calls on this as it may be running out of steam as it gets up here. But again, please throw in the comment section below. What are you seeing in the main indexes and main Magnificent 7 that is showing bearishness, right? We even talk about the RSP. RSP, equal weight S&P, broader market rally, the Russell. Why I started playing the Russell is because I saw this massive gap and go. I was like, okay, bullish time. Russell has crazy runs. I want to profit off of it. And then for the market, right? Let's just go over a quick options trade you can play on the market to know. And this is going to work from the NASDAQ or S&P. I'm going to show you both real quick. So here we have the option trade that I really wanted to show you guys, which is basically a reverse iron control, essentially. You're buying two debit spreads, which a debit transaction is where you take theta. You don't actually um, take, uh, get theta benefit, but regardless of that, you're looking for an explosive move in the market. And this is where you can decide how much risk on risk off you wanna have, right? Keeping the balance between the trades, right? A delta of 1.3, so we can actually move the um, long strikes up to 575, 69 on the market is the expected move. You can put this on actually of the day of the FOMC. This range will be contracted a little bit, but then again, you're looking to put it right at what the expected move is, right around a, a the delta of the wings to be about 20, right? That's where you're targeting 20, uh, 25 ish right so to balance it out there's more potential to the upside so obviously they're pricing in a bigger move there looking at this you're putting 49 dollars to make 51 dollars 
if the market goes up or the market goes down. You're looking for that explosive move and you can change it, right, by changing how wide you're making the wings. The wings are referred to the two ends of the con uh, the, the spread, right? Iron condor is consisted of four contracts, buying two options and selling two options. So, and the reverse is basically how it's two debit versus two uh, credit spreads. But to make a simple thing short, if you buy the 570, uh, sorry, you buy the 568 call and buy the 556 put, and then you sell the 554 and sell the 570 respectively, then you have this setup and you can go to option strat. I'll link down in the description below exactly how this is set up. And you can play around with the profitability of this, right? As I make the wings bigger, I get more profit. Every single time I move it down, I'm basically making $50 more, right? Maximum, sorry. And then there is a point where it becomes diminishing returns. So you don't wanna necessarily move the buy one up. You wanna almost move the sell one out so you can basically make more of a profit if you have that to balance it out. Really, you want one-to-one -one ratio on these where you're for every dollar you're risking, you're getting a dollar back. It's not the most optimal, but for these big catalyst moves, it is very profitable. I may experiment with this trade on FOMC day because you'll know you can kill it. And also I'm putting it out for essentially to the end of the week because I want to allow it to basically sit out there, not take too much theta essentially, and just, if I'm wrong, okay, I cut the trade real quick. If I'm right, you could go out another week, right? Similar strikes, similar deltas, and you could basically set the same trade up on the NASDAQ. And actually, let's go set the same trade up on the NASDAQ, where we're gonna go to the 20th as well. Again, wider move, looking for a delta, selling the 484.78. Again, this is because they just pay out a dividend on the NASDAQ. And similar story here, kind of setting it up on the wings. $117 maximum loss versus $183 maximum profit. So again, simple, simple trade that you can set up. This means the move is gonna be pretty expansive. And as setting this up, let's say one o'clock on a Wednesday, you'll have contraction of the level, so they'll be cheaper for you to play. So you're not putting as much risk on and you don't have to move as much. So it's the best of both worlds. I wouldn't necessarily initiate this on Monday. I'll wait till one o'clock Wednesday before we head into the FOMC. And then you can see how this all plays out. I will post any updates of this trade in the Discord. So make sure you guys are following on that. And with that, Fatal is going to give you guys the biggest winners and losers. And then we'll be back for the discussion part of the video. We have now passed the second week of possibly the most volatile month this quarter. Last week, guys, it was absolutely crazy, right? With job numbers, job expectations, that kind of stuff. This week, we had CPI, the last CPI before next week, which is the FOMC meeting. So that's going to be really, really fun. This is it, the FOMC, where we're going to get the rate cut. At least that's what's anticipated. And because of that, you guys can see that markets are just non-stop rallying. Now, we did have a little bit of an issue here going into September 11th, but then after that, guys, it's just up, 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 up. On the five days, the S&P gained 3.1%, and on Friday alone, it gained half of a percent. And now, when taking a look at this week's upcoming earnings, we can see that there's pretty much nothing there. On Monday, we got four companies, nothing really too much of note. On Tuesday, we got one company, that's Ferguson. That's really it. Wednesday is the first time this week that we're going to get something interesting. General Mills, that really is it. Maybe Steelcase. Aside from that, nothing really much here. On Thursday, we do have the big one here of FedEx, which this one does speak a lot in regards to the, the economy sense. Uh, you know how many people are buying stuff and sending stuff. So this can be an indicator to that. But also, guys, Cracker Barrel as well. And on Friday, we only have one company, and that's Temboran, TBN. That really is it. So taking a look at the S&P 500 heat map, this is a massive reversal to what we saw last week. Everything now is essentially in the green with pockets of red. For starters, we got the technology sector. Guys, the worst performer here is actually really, really easy to find. It is Adobe. They did have earnings. Sorry, I couldn't cover it. Obviously, you guys know my situation. But worst performer here was Adobe losing 4.71%. Yeah, this was the worst performer. Actually, there was only... Uh, only a handful of companies showed that loss. We got HPE losing. We got Garmin losing, as well as this one over here, EPAM um, losing. That really is it. Everything else was in the green by a lot. And the best performer was Broadcom. AVGO gaining 22.41%. A few days ago, last week, actually, this thing was $135. 
the, the semiconductor sector was falling apart, mainly due to Broadcom themselves for their own earnings. And right now we have essentially erased all of those losses. So if you guys bought at the $135 mark, congratulations, you're now up a massive, massive amount. Looking now into the communication services, a lot of green here as well. Worst performer seems to be the company. Take two interactive losing 2.83% and the best performer. It is the company Warner Bros. Discovery gaining 17 and a half, almost 17.6% into now the consumer cyclicals looking now into the consumer cyclicals everything here is massively in the green worst performer it is the company bath and body works this thing's just a straight line down losing 4.83 percent and the best performer by the looks of it guys seems to be it's actually a lot of wow okay we got um i do believe it's that one that one i just saw right there let me just do a quick glance just to make sure yep guys it seems to be the company uh norwegian cruise lines uh gaining 14.04 percent but i mean you got companies like amazon guys 8.81 percent absolutely massive almost 200 bucks on that one lululemon guys 5.09 percent going up after a you know decently after a decent crash right there so really interesting right there looking down to the consumer defensives a lot of red here this is by far the most red that we have seen so far whereas performer seems to be the company tyson foods losing 6.79 percent and the best performer it is the company kroger gaining 6.96 percent essentially seven percent also walmart guys look at this walmart gaining um you guys can barely see that but gain 5.17 percent now 80 dollars and 60 cents i mean if you guys take a look at that graph that is just up 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 all the way look now into the financials we can see here a kind of mixed we do have a lot of deep red but also a lot of deep green worst performer it is none other than the company jp morgan losing 3.83 percent and the best performer wow okay it's definitely this one um definitely this one blackstone inc gaining 10.26 percent looking now into the healthcare green there's just two pockets of massive massive red worst performer company humana losing 10.14% and the best performer in the whole entire sector. It is none other than the cut. It does seem to be that one, guys. It really does seem to be. Yep. Seems to be none other than the company uh, Align gaining 10.21% into now the industrials a lot of green here wow i foresee fedex if fedex does good and the markets likes fedex earnings, this could be up, up, up even more by the end of this week and we can see here that the worst performer is a company well southwest airlines only losing 3.43 percent i say only but that's actually a lot 3.43 percent and the best performer oh boy this is gonna be a this is gonna be a tough one to find uh, it'll probably take me here a bit it is none other guys in the company ge aerospace gaining 10.57 percent absolutely crazy but also take a look at this one guys we got carrier global also gaining 10.12 percent looking now into real estate this is all in the green oh my goodness of course we have to talk about realty income 62 dollars and 71 cents guys almost 63 dollars so again we had about like nine months to buy this company sub 50 hopefully y'all did Hopefully you all did. But you guys can see that uh, there's only one loser here. And that is the company Simon Properties only losing 0.29%. And the best performer in the whole entire sector seems to be the company, well, a DLR, which is a company that I own. A company I'm really glad I do own. Gaining 7.23%. And my mistake, guys, I am so sorry. It's actually not DLR. It's actually the company BXP gaining 7.38%. My bad on that one. Now, the utilities all in the green except for two companies the companies are eix edison international losing 1.42 percent and the worst performer pcg losing 1.54 percent aside from that though everything else is massively massively in the green with the best performer being none other than the company vistra gaining 16.08 percent but guys, I mean, you take a look at these ones down here. You got GEV 13.74, crazy CEG 13.21. I mean, NEE. Remember when this thing crashed the utility sector by itself? Well, there you guys have it. Uh, hopefully y'all took advantage when that crash happened. I did. I really wish I would have bought a lot more of Southern Company when that occurred. But yeah, Southern Company right now, I feel like all utilities right now are very, very expensive. Looking now into the energy sector. Guys, the reddest sector that we have seen so far I mean, this is by far the reddest sector in this whole entire market. And I look at this and I'm like, 
buying opportunity. This is all I see when I when I when I look, take a look at this sector, because oil prices are coming down. As you guys saw, I mean, it was the only one in the negative when it came to uh, this the CPI. And if you guys have not seen the video of me covering the CPI, here is the video. Make sure that you guys check it out. But you guys can see that this is pretty much all in the red and the ones that are in the green are barely in the green the worst performer here this is a company apa losing 5.15 percent maybe we should cover some of the energy sector now honestly seeing that this is in the red and the best performer it is the company uh williams Coes inc gaining 1.74 percent but also guys we got chevron i mean you guys see that graph it's it's coming down gaining 1.48 percent but the price is 140 dollars and 61 cents and lastly, the basic materials, most of this is very deeply in the green with only a few losing, actually only two losing. We got the company's uh, LYB, Lindell Basel Industries, losing a third of a percent. And the worst performer, Dow Inc., losing 1.05%. And the best performer in the whole entire sector, it is the company Albemarle, gaining 13.71%. So, guys, that pretty much does it for this part of the video. Again, I'm so terribly sorry. I wish I could have done a lot more videos this week. Um, I did make a coverage of the CPI, so if you guys have not seen that, make sure to check it out. I will try my best to live stream this upcoming Wednesday, the FOMC, when it comes out at around 2 o'clock. I will try my best, okay? I will try my best. If you guys do not see a live stream, then that means I can't, okay? But I will try my best on that one. And again, thank you guys for being so patient and so understanding for the current situation that me and my family are currently going through. Again, thank you guys so much. And we'll see what happens with this upcoming week when it comes to the FOMC, because it's going to be, it's going to be fun. And it may present as a great buying opportunity. We shall see. With that said, that pretty much does it. Take it away, Mike. So I figure we start off with the elephant in the room as always as we head into the FOMC. Uh, good sir, what is your thoughts for in the federal rate cuts? 50, 25, none, kind of a wishy-wash between the two, data dependent? I think we're going to get 25. This idea that we are going to get 50, I think it's ridiculous. I mean, last time I checked, the, what, the CME tool said that it was like a, like higher than a 50% chance for uh for a 25 yeah right? it was so people are around thinking that, 75 yeah but it, at one point there was like 50 50 i'm not yep. so certain of what it is right now though but i'm assuming well, it's literally said, 50 50 wow if okay. you said 50 50 uh you'd be correct and also this is the best case scenario for markets actually because it doesn't swing the pendulum to one side. Now, we have to be cautious that this doesn't change going into the Fed meeting, right? If we get a complete skew to 100% one side, then we're actually going to get a very poor reaction, in my opinion, because if you skew to one side and you get it, then it's like, well, then you start saying our expectations met for market participants. And we've seen with earnings what happens. But if you kind of have this like, no one's really sure of what's going to be the true number, Everyone F FOMOs into the market whenever they don't get their scenario. So if you get 50, everyone FOMOs. If you get 25, everyone FOMOs because it's just the perfect mashup of a bull rally. And that's why that, I'm positioned bullish. That is completely ludicrous. You, you understand how that's completely... Yes. Like not I, what I, you just said. Yeah, I agree with what you about just the said. About FOMOing the, the market. Idea, the idea, the idea that uh, it's good to have it at 50-50 because no matter what the scenario, it'll be bullish it's like markets only go up yeah but i do have um i did send you a really interesting article that it's oh, yeah. sounding again we, we always say here and it's not just us uh people always say that history doesn't repeat itself but it rhymes yeah and that article is from seeking alpha and if you want to pull it up right there yeah. that one yeah inflation virtually a non-issue because huh. quote by the way that's a quote, I remember, by the way. I remember someone saying that in the 1970s. You know. No, I would. You're going way too far. Right. You're going way too far, good sir. How about 2021? The yeah. inflation transitory na yes. narrative. Yes. Cue, cue the, the clip of Jerome Powell. Cue, yeah. cue the clip of Jerome Powell saying uh, shipmates, right? The good ship transitory was a crowded one <laughs> with most mainstream analysts and advanced economy central bankers on board. I think I see some former, former shipmates out there today. <laughs> it's the exact same narrative, just with different words. Inflation yep. virtually, or quote, virtually a non-issue. Sounding very, very similar to, hey, inflation is transitory. 
Okay. Last time I checked, hang on a minute. Last time I checked, because I covered, I did a video, guys. If you guys haven't checked it out, please check it out. Uh, I covered the CPI inflation. Core's still at 3.2. The no, one no, that the Fed no, likes is still at 3.2. Don't worry. It's going down. It Don't worry. Everything's calm. We're calm collected. Tom Lee said 40% rallying the Russell. So just, just calm your horses. Stop being a bear, you know. Not being, a bear, not being a bear, just looking at reality. Because I, I think, think about it, think about it. The CPI, the normal CPI has gone down, but why did it go down? Once Oil. again, energy, yeah. right? But now you have to ask the question, why is energy going down? Lack of demand? Yeah, well, it's the, um, the similar to how Last copper. time I checked, hang on a minute. Last time I checked, we had a lack of demand. It was because of COVID. Yeah. So what was causing this lack of demand now? And oil. Funny that you bring up oil, right? Like j jumping real quick to oil, um, we can see that the oil prices, even though OPEC has announced uh, voluntary cuts, right? Most of the OPEC countries are cutting. Oil is not reacting in the traditional way. Like if we go back to when OPEC last time uh, said, hey, voluntary cuts, which was mm -hmm. around here. And oil rallied from a low of 68 all the way to 84 or $87. And right now, yeah, right? Yeah, but you could argue, but you could argue if, if you go back on that graph a little bit, right there, right there, right there, at around like between the December and between, the, yeah, right there. That's looking a lot like it is right now. Yeah, not really because you you're out, significant. Yeah, but you're, signi you're a lower low. Your low here and your low here is lower and you have lower highs. So this is trending down drastically. And also if we zoom out to like a larger time scale, it's mm -hmm. just a, if you can draw a straight line from uh, peak to trough, right? This is, this is one gigantic. And if those that like trade oil, right? You bounced, you're in this wedge that essentially you're gonna look for oil to break 65 before um, you get really bullish appreciation, right? Like you can do it, but this is, so if you get this scenario, you get the inflationary narrative coming back and oil basically wrecking CPI for the foreseeable future. If you get this narrative down here, it's the soft landings cancel narratives. So whichever way you slice it, you're, you're crap out of luck. Well, that's funny because uh, that, that's also a, the second article I sent you on, um, on Seeking Alpha as well. And it's the, it's the other one. Yep. Uh, yeah. U.S. economy <laughs> heading for a soft landing, FT survey shows. Hey, you know what other thing they said doesn't matter anymore during a survey? Like, you know, that, 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 that was a poll. Can you remember? Yeah. Can you remind me what that pesky thing was that we said? It was, yeah, it was, um, it was like, it was like majority of economists uh, believe that the yield curve uh, has no significance on, um, on a, I'm calling out a recession now. Yes. And for all those that were trolling me all week when this thing was going back to zero, I won. Just for the record, we're still well, uninverted. I would, uh, still uninverted. Say that again after the FOMC. Okay. <laughs> Say that again after okay, I will. Right? I will create a rant video just for you, sir, because and all you trolls in the damn Discord, and I will go on a one-hour rant in the Discord for you. Fair enough. Fair enough. But So... That's essentially what's happening. I mean, obviously, the the C, the CPI, well, not CPI, the FOMC is the big, big thing right yeah. now. And so I love how it's 37 economists, the exact same number like last time. Was it <laughs> really? Was it yes, really the, the yield curve, I remember, it was 30 out of 37. This time, a survey of 37 economists uh, between September 11 and September 13. Mm -hmm. And then they're, they're also going into like GDP and stuff like that. When is the next time we get a GDP print? Because usually they're around the uh, CPI number, or sorry, the Fed meeting, but it could be the following week that we get another print. But the other thing is that this meeting so, so important is that it's a summary of economic projection meeting. So we're actually going to see what the Fed is thinking. So it's going to be very interesting between the dual narratives of Jerome Powell never promised you rate cuts. He just said it's time to shift policy. They can do that right. through uh, tapering their balance sheet, stopping tapering their balance sheet, right? So we can talk about that as well in the in the stream that we're going to have on Wednesday for it. But the main thing is going to be what, what well, is we'll he try projecting? to have the stream. Yeah, we'll try to have the stream on Wednesday. Yeah. We'll figure it out. We'll figure it out for you guys. But again. 
there's multiple things he can do. He can taper rates to basically be level and say, hey, jobs are degrading, but we don't think it's bad enough. And then maybe just, I think he's gonna give you 25. But I think the more important thing is gonna be the projection because the markets, again, are pricing in this scenario of multiple 25 basis rate cuts consecutively over the preceding next five meetings, right? They're expecting the majority right now to be near, there's still a 50 in play here somewhere. It's not that we're gonna cut 25, 20, 25. That would land you mm -hmm. at the 425 to 450. The majority are 1.5 rates, right? right? That's right. what they're believing. And you don't get that. Three times 25 is not 1.5. So essentially you're expecting 250s. And I think that's where we could set up some disappointment from the Fed or people just reprice it in. The market basically says, you know what, I'm just going to go up. Like we just mentioned, markets only go up. And the thing is, you're primed for it with the uh, fear and greed sitting in a position that's basically prime for either side to win or play it out. We're literally at 50. You, Everything's you, at 50. Yeah. Everything's at 50 right Fed rate now. Cuts, you, got CME fear and greed. you got the, you got the, you got the, you got the. You got the yep. yield curve inversion somewhat at 50. It's like we don't we don't know what's going to happen now. Uh, we we have the we have the fear and greed index at 50. Everything's just like up in the air, I guess. Yeah, it's up it's going to be a very very volatile week, I think, because as I cover with VIX, it's in a position that it can again. It's the story of 50 50. The VIX is in a position that can screw either team over. You got the fear and greed that can go either way. You got the CME tool that can go either way. You literally have everything on a hairpin's edge. The indexes are like very close to breaking out to new all-time highs on some of them. And the Russell looks like it wants to rally. So again, it's like, but you also have the scenarios where we can see everything going to hell in a handbasket, right? Jerome Powell mm -hmm. comes out, pauses too long on something, and then the whole market just basically falls apart. Mm -hmm. Right. It, it's Absolutely. just you're prime for that wonderful, chaotic uh, break. Right. And again, just because we get a rate cut doesn't necessarily mean that markets can go up. Right. Uh, I mean, we, we saw guys inflation still 3.2 percent. In fact, I have it. I, I, I pulled it up on the economic calendar, guys. So the core on the year over year is 3.2 in line with what it was even the prior month. But if we take a look at this, guys, we this is now the second consecutive month of it staying the same at that 3.2 mark. So that's one thing to note. The other thing to note is the fact that um, if you take a look at the month over month one, it's gone up. Oh, yeah. The month over month one went up from 0.2, right, previous month, to 0.3. So explain to me how that article from Seeking Alpha, virtually no issue, explain to me how that is. now. If you take a look at the normal CPI, that makes a little bit more sense, but the Fed doesn't do that, right? The Fed doesn't look at that normal CPI, which is yeah. funny because if they would have, Mike, if they would have taken a look at that no normal CPI, they would see no progress whatsoever. Was, no, 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 no. The actual normal CPI, it actually, it's actually favorable for like more than a 25 basis cut. Really? Yes, because oil has just completely crashed it. Oh, uh, okay. Well, but, but that goes back it. to why they say it's not their preferred metric because the volatility, because they would have to change policy left and right every single meeting if they. But it's funny. It's funny because because if they were to do it, if they were to actually take it into account, it would actually favor them right now. Yeah. yeah. It would actually well, you favor know, them. Already... And, they could, and they could actually and they could actually say the narrative. We got this under control. CPI just went from inflation just went from two point nine down to two point five. That's massive. Yep. Because they're not. It's funny how it's a double edged sword. That's, oh yeah. That's the same what, what the same about. way it's a double edged sword with basically like not shifting policy rapidly. You don't necessarily get to claim the victories. But again, CPI is one of those like fast paced moving in, uh, metrics. So again. Are they going to start putting uh, stuff back into CPI now to maybe like calm the rate of fall just so it's less volatile now? Well, the funny thing is going to the core CPI now, the one thing, at least one of the things that's keeping it up a lot is Shelter. owner's equivalent rents. Shelter. It's literally Shelter. like a thorough pain in the butt for the Fed at four point, was it 4.9 or five? Five, five, five. It's, it's upwards of like 5.1, 5. 5. 5.3. Yep. And it's not going anywhere again until you see degradation in the housing market, which everyone's like, 
I can't believe how many YouTubers are talking about oh housing crash and this and that. I'm like, what data are you looking at, right? Like we haven't, you're heading into the seasonality phase of housing and you're saying, oh, look at market crash. I'm like, again, yes, there's more homes. There's a crap ton of buyers still and they're not going down in price. Right, right. And, and, and with a rate cut. Yeah. Yeah. Good luck. It's not going to happen. Yeah, yeah. The but only way, I've, I've always said this, the only way that you can actually get a market crash is if people are forced to sell. Yeah. And it's what they'll do is they'll cite like Florida, for example, right? Like I'm sure you've seen the articles on X and all that about like how commercial real estate's falling apart in Florida. I just want to make something very, very clear to everyone. The United States does not consist of Florida only. There's 49 right. other states. And in 49 right. other states combined, housing's still going up. Right, on a nationwide scale, it's still going up. The only reason why Florida's going down is because there was such an influx in 2020 yeah. and 2021 that now people are leaving, right? And that's what's causing it to drop. But yeah. like, it's still a higher low than before. Yeah, it's they're still not a higher taking, low. You're, again, the, and you'll get people that point out like, look, this company walked away from a billion dollar property. Okay, and name me one successful corporation that didn't do that, right? right. Sometimes it's just better right. to say bon voyage right. versus just saying we're going to try fixing this thing, right? It's mm -hmm. better sometimes mm -hmm. just walk away from a trade and let it run its course than trying to force more and more and more, right? Like valuable totally lessons about stuff. Fully agree. So yeah, man, this is going to be a really, really interesting week. I'll probably have to talk to you about uh, selling a covered call on Broadcom because I do think that it still has... I still have the ability to do so with with a high IV coming going into Wednesday. Oh yeah, um, not as high as it was with earnings, but I would actually I would actually argue it's higher. Um, uh, so we'll talk about that. Um, yeah, chips actually were one week. of the lagging sectors, so definitely they have a lot of potential to be the leading sector this week. I don't know what you're talking about because Broadcom gained twenty percent just on Friday or oh. Thursday and Friday. So well, I'm talking push. about the king. The king Nvidia didn't really do much. It gained like 15%. I covered it. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, no, it, it gained a lot. It gained a lot. But it um, didn't, but yeah, we'll, it didn't we'll, gain we'll enough when I bought it. <laughs> so, we'll talk about that yeah. um, like privately later this week. Uh, again, go, go back to the Fear and Greed Index for a second. Yep. And we'll let you okay, know guys. about what we're going to do in the Discord, guys. So, make sure you follow us on the Discord. Link in the description below. Yeah. So thank you all so much for your prayers, guys. I really do appreciate it. I'm actually heading, like, as of I'm recording this, we're about to head out to go see our son in the hospital. Um, I I cannot join in the, well, first of all, I, I don't know, Mike, are we going, are you going to have a stream today for like the I will market? See. I will see what I'm up to. Okay. Because I most likely can't because mm -hmm. I will be in the hospital at the time. So, so terribly sorry for that, guys. But if Mike can, then, you know, he knows how to set it up now. So there yeah. you guys have it. Um, but aside from that, guys, thank you so much uh, for all your prayers. Now, one more news on me. I will try, try. I know last week I tried doing this. I couldn't. But this week, I'm going to do it in advance. I'm going to try to take off Wednesday. So that way, on Wednesday morning, I can go see my son, come back uh, before the FOMC starts, uh, or at least be before 2 o'clock, so that way I can actually stream 2 o'clock covering the the FOMC and then covering Jerome Powell's um, statements at 2:30. So just let you know, I'm gonna try to do that. All right. So yeah. All right. Well, ladies and gentlemen, thank you all so much for watching, and make sure you guys hit the like button on the way out. Have the subscribe button enabled with bell notifications so YouTube and join the Discord where we notify you more better than YouTube does because recently YouTube has been uh, very, very poor at that. But make sure you guys join the Discord, interact with us, see you guys possibly later on the stream. And thank you again so much for watching and I'll see you in the next one.